Is he a serious runner? Yeah, he um, he runs down. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So just thank you all for uh, coming today. This is uh, one of our events in the 125th anniversary of, uh, the, of Hood College. Uh, uh, and we're going to talk today about a little known part of uh, that history. And my talk is the real good Chip Hood. My name is Jeff Welsh. I'm the instructional technologist for Hood College. And today I'm uh, someone in the 29th Infantry Division, uh, <laughs> circa 1945. So um, again, thank you. I, I will try to adhere to our one hour and our uh, time limit. We really have 50 minutes, so I'll do my best. Um, if you could just hold questions for the end, um, I'll be happy to entertain those questions as we go. But hopefully I'll uh, be able to take you on a journey back to uh, World War II era Hood College. So I want to start off with something. It's just something to listen to. Um, the first time I heard about the good ship Hood was not the actual World War II ship. It was a song as part of preparation for a reunion called Come Aboard the Good Ship Hood. So we have some of our... You, I know you could. And again, just before I get started, if, uh, our alums who are here today, if you could just raise your hand um, just so we could identify some of our alums here today. Okay, great. We'll get, more, we'll get, we'll get to more of that later. But um, if you can just sort of close your eyes, think back, it's 1945, 1940s, and uh, think of this song, and for me, when I heard this song, uh, that was where I got the title, The Real Good Ship. So it was 2004, I had been talking, probably to Krista or someone, and, um, and I had uh, said, you know, there's an interesting thing going on, there's a lot of hood memorabilia being sold on eBay. And so, in a search on eBay, um, I found this thing right here, I'm going to pass it around. This is a naval cover, and I said, wow, what a strange thing, it says the SS Hood Victory, I've never heard, heard of Hood having a ship named after it. And I, <coughs> As a World War II historian and enthusiast, I said, I've got to find out more information about that. So if you'd like, just pass that around. $3.90 uh, is the going rate today. I think I probably paid a dollar fifty. so it's quite a markup <laughs> since 2004. Good investment. Um, so pretty much immediately after I, I'm, I'm literally, the next day, I came in and I sought out uh, Phyllis Townsend who used to be our archivist here, um, and I said, Phyllis, 
do we have any information on this thing called the SS Hood Victory? I'm very interested in finding out more information about that. She goes, well, yeah, Jeff, there's a whole shelf full of stuff back in the archives. So she took me back into the archives, and pretty much the first thing I laid eyes on was this plaque. Um, the plaque that you see under the TV is the actual plaque. Um, and what's great about this that I later learned in my research is that this just wasn't a plaque that the college bought to commemorate the fact that we had, had a ship named after it. This is the actual plaque that was on the ship. So this plaque was returned to the college. Um, this is the plaque that we gave to the U.S. Maritime Commission to put on the ship, and it was returned to us in 1947. Beyond that, I found this wonderfully decorated box with this sterling silver engraving talking about the christening ceremony on June 9, 1945. And as you can see up here on the table, uh, there is the box. And inside of that box, if I could open it up for you virtually, <laughs> is the actual christening bottle. Now, there wasn't any champagne left in there. Uh, I couldn't really smell any champagne. But if you actually touch the bottle, you can feel the broken bottle inside. But this was on a very, 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 very long red and white and blue string that was up at the top of the ship. And so when it, was, uh, when it struck the ship, it went with the ship. So really cool thing. Um, this is actually the pass that uh, those who attended the event would have been given. Uh, you can imagine in World War II, even in 1945, uh, there was quite a bit of security. They didn't want the bad guys getting in and seeing how we were building ships, so everyone had to have a pass. This is the college bulletin of the time. This actually came out in July of 1945. And you can see here, this was the first time when I saw this document, this, this, uh, this magazine, that was the first time I actually saw a picture of the ship, and you can see obviously it says Hood Victory on the side, very clearly. And then this newspaper was again uh, where I started to find out some of the tidbits, starting to find out some of the information about the ship. And uh, really, I was very intrigued because there was a lot of information, a lot of documents. Um, so that was in 2005. And I was very interested at the time. I'd spent a lunch or two looking through the documents. And then life got in the way. But needed me to do other things. And I kind of put it out of my mind uh, for a while. But I've always thought to myself, I'm going to find a really good reason to do a talk. And that really good reason is not only the 125th anniversary of Hood College, but also I wanted to do it around Veterans Day. Because I wanted to um, pay tribute to uh, the, the really, the, the truly, the patrons of the SS Hood victory were the U.S. Uh, soldiers who were being brought back from war. Uh, they were really the benefactors of this ship. So, let's talk about Hood during the war years. Uh, Hood, like many other institutions, had to change. The war uh, required the college to change quite a bit. We couldn't do business as usual as we had done. Um, and it was very, uh, it was a time where the college was very motivated to be as helpful as possible. And one of the things which I thought was a brilliant marketing uh, uh, idea of the time was they actually created a lot of literature and they said, you need to send your daughter to the college because we're going to train her in any one of these very critical uh, war effort skills. She's going to leave here with a bachelor's degree and she'll be able to go and serve uh, her country um, in one of these many fields. So these were the fields that uh, the college encouraged the students and marketed to the students at the time um, to go into a lot of paraprofessional, you'll see a lot of medical um, and, and um, psychology, uh, again, uh, different things that were either filling in the gaps for the soldiers that weren't here or in support of that war effort. Um, other things that were happening at Hood or not happening were the college had to put a lot of big projects on hold. The biggest project of the time was a $200,000 gymnasium that we know as Gamble Gymnasium today um, and swimming pool. And you can see this is an early concept art from one of the great days reporting that unfortunately, you know, the, uh, the $200,000 gymnasium is going to have to wait until the war is over. Uh, so uh, that was an interesting thing that was going on at the time. 
Uh, the students were very, very active and engaged in the war effort, uh, from civilian defense to <coughs> the different uh, roles in community service, and lots and lots of campaigns for the Red Cross. The, the item on the uh, right, uh, your right, is actually a blue and gray today where they printed the Red Cross symbol on it to promote raising money for the Red Cross. Um, like many organizations and institutions of the time, Hood was extremely uh, involved. The students were very involved in war bond drives. They had seven successful war bond drives. And as you can see from this article, uh, we actually received a war bond drive flag, which was actually a very, very sought after thing. Um, so uh, you were doing good for the country, but you were also getting that recognition. Now, these are the types of things as we go through that I wish I knew where that flag was. What happened to that flag? It's not in the archive. So unfortunately, one of the tales I'll be telling today is that many of the things that I'm talking about are not here on this table, unfortunately. They've been lost uh, to time in some capacity. But very, very fortunately, we've done an excellent job here at the college of preserving old newspapers, newspaper clippings. Um, so I was extremely thankful as I was doing my research that I had that information. And our alumni were serving in the war actively. So you'll see that uh, we had uh, dietitians commissioned into the Army, and you'll see that both the Army, uh, the Army, the Navy, and the Red Cross all had multiple alumni serving actively in World War II to support uh, the country during that time. So let's talk about our victory ship. Um, victory ships were the replacement for the Liberty ship. The Liberty ship is more likely, <coughs> than, uh, as far as the ships go, it's more well known in history. Uh, but the victory ship allowed uh, for us to create it more quickly. It was a faster ship. It could carry more things. Um, and it really was an improvement. It was, the, in our terms today, the 2.0 uh, technology of the original Liberty ship. So it was built off of things that were learned about the Liberty ship. But for Hood to get a Victory ship, we had to do quite a bit of political campaigning in 1945. And to do that, this gentleman, Grayson H. Staley, was the person who helped us tremendously doing that. Um, now one of the things that uh, I uh, discovered as I've been going through this process is are these articles that I'm reading and the pictures actually the pictures of the people that I think that they are? So I'm going to give you the, here's the disclaimer. I believe that this is Grayson H. Staley based on my research, but there's a very good chance that he's not. But I'll tell you why I think he, this is him. Um, and again, one of the things that I've learned in talking with some of our, uh, the folks in our history department is that I've only scratched the surface on the documents that we have here. This is an excellent, excellent opportunity for our students to take my initial research and then to vet it, verify, make sure that some of the things I have right. I was just talking to one of our alums here earlier today and she said, I don't think the person that you think is that person in the picture is actually that person. <laughs> so again, uh, forgive me if I've gotten some of this wrong, but I had to speculate as sometimes you do when you're researching things from the past and you don't have as good of information as you'd like to. But we're going to go with this gentleman being Grayson H. Staley at this point. Um, Mr. Staley in 1943 and 1944 actually helped uh, Frederick, the Frederick community, get two other ships named after it. Um, one was the SS Barbara Fritchie, the other was the SS Frederick Victory. So it was actually a victory ship, but it was called the SS Frederick Victory. I'd like to do some more research on these ships. I think the Barbara Fritchie uh, actually was in some pretty dangerous places and probably had a few um, zigzags that it had to do in the Atlantic or the Mediterranean to get away from U-boats. Um, so again, that's another opportunity maybe for our students or myself to continue my research. Uh, so prior to 1945, the Maritime Commission, uh, so this wasn't a Navy ship, this was U.S. Merchant Marine ship, the Victory and Liberty ships, uh, they actually would not allow a college who had less than 500 <coughs> students enrolled to have a ship named after them. 
So this was something, we were like at 475 students one year, and 481 students the other year, so we were very, very close. But Mr. Staley did an excellent job uh, working with President uh, Henry Stair to actively petition the Merchant uh, Marine to allow for a Liberty ship to be named after Hood College. Um, and successfully, we were able to do that on April 21st, 1945. We received confirmation, the president of the college received confirmation that in fact a new ship would be built and it would be named the SS Hood Victory in honor of Hood College. So again, thank you to Mr. Uh, Grayson Staley for doing that. He is someone that, uh, in Frederick, if you've ever gone to a nearby park called Staley Park, that's the, the Staley that it's named after. So, Another interesting thing that I learned in doing my research is that uh, we and many other institutions would supply the ship with a library. And not only would we supply the ship with a library of books, but we would supply, uh, and we did supply the SS Hood Victory with an album of pictures of the college, uh, a <coughs> framed photo of the college of the time, because again, we wanted those <coughs> troops and those sailors that, that were part of the Merchant Marine to know more about the identity, the namesake of the ship that they were sailing on. So it was very uh, normal practice for an institution, uh, even a small institution like Hood, to provide a library that went onto the ship. And we bought that through the American Merchant uh, Marine Library Association. Uh, so they had, this is an actual pamphlet that they send us as part of the archive. Um, and one of the things that they would do is they provide you with a, uh, a little sticker that you can see a facsimile of it up here that would go inside of each of the books. And then you also would have a plaque. So in Hood's case, that was the sticker that we have a couple of copies of that was supposed to go into the book, um, as well as this is a mimeograph of the time of the bronze uh, plaque that was then placed on top of the uh, book case that would be put on the ship. So we're not 100% sure, I'm not 100% sure if this is the type of book case that was actually put on the SS Hood Victory. Again, we have very few <coughs> pictures, um, but this was a typical design and uh, we bought 140 books for the ship. Um, and if you were just to look over here again to your right, uh, you'll see some of the books. These are actual books the actual books that we uh, gave to the ship in the sense that these are the titles. But in doing some of my research uh, with Mary Atwell, our archivist, we haven't been able to find any of the matching books that were first issue, 1945 books that matched the list of the 140 books that were on the ship that we can actually confirm were on the ship. We do know that the books were returned to the college or some of the books were returned in particular encyclopedias, but there's a blurb in the letter that says, and you don't necessarily have to return the other books, but we'd like to have the encyclopedias back. <laughs> so I really want to believe that somewhere in this pile of books here on the table or on my library cart, uh, 58 books remain here in our stacks that match the books that would have been out of the 140 um, on the ship. Um, and again, we had interesting books like Moby Dick, and uh, other things, you're thinking, why does someone want to read this at sea? But uh, certainly that was one of the books. Uh, History of the Merchant Marine. This is a picture uh, from a film that I found online. Uh, this might have been what uh, the ship's library looked like. It would have been in a very small place. It would have been very modest. There would have been a checkout. But again, uh, this is just a close-up of the books that I have up here on the table. But these are some of the titles. Uh, some, some good reading, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later. So the books didn't just go on the ship and, you know, to collect dust. They were, as reported from the, the, uh, the sailors on the ship and the troops, they were regularly read as part of their voyage because it wasn't a uh, day-long voyage. It wasn't a two-day-long voyage. It was a week or a week-and-a-half voyage uh, across the Atlantic. So good time to collect your thoughts and read <coughs> So uh, let's talk about building the SS Hood Victory. This is really incredible when you think about uh, the production that we were able to accomplish in 1945. Uh, so this is a profile of what 
uh, a schematic would have been in the 1940s for a typical victory ship. Our victory ship was built here in Maryland, which is really great, I think, uh, when you think about it, because there were many ships that were built in the Quincy Yards or that were built in California, but we're a Maryland school with a ship built in Maryland. That's pretty pretty cool stuff, I think. Yeah, uh, great shipbuilder. This is an interesting point. I just heard something to bring it into uh, our time now. The Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard is at a place called Sparrows Point in uh, Baltimore. <laughs> And uh, the, the actual steel mill went defunct uh, probably five to ten years ago or maybe less. Uh, so Sparrows Point is a pretty desolate place right now. But um, I'm uh, somewhat happy to say that it's actually going to be rebuilt, not as a shipyard, but as an Amazon processing facility. <laughs> so Amazon is coming to Maryland and they're going to reinvigorate that space. But what I found really interesting in doing my research about the Bethlehem Fairfield shipyard is that, uh, as you've heard, there was a shortage of workers. So really, uh, what you saw at the Bethlehem Fairfield shipyard was a tremendous amount of diversity in the workforce. Um, there were people from all races, colors, and creeds that were working um, at this facility to get these ships out for victory um, and support the war effort. So this is just some uh, photos that I found uh, representing some of the people that you might have seen there in 1945 building our ship. So um, if you want to watch the video, I'm going to uh, walk you through uh, some things. This is a, um, a video that was produced on how a victory ship is created. Now I've sped it up because it's a little bit long, but I just want to kind of give you a sense of all the things that go into creating a victory ship. And then I'll give you some details as we look through. So uh, for our ship, uh, construction um, would begin on April 25th, 1945. Um, you would see that our, our ship, or the victory ships of the day, those ships were 40, 450 feet long and 62 feet wide. So it was a, very, it was a fairly large ship for its time. Uh, the ship uh, could carry up to 10,800 tons. Uh, was its actual weight and it could actually carry 9,146 tons of cargo. You'll see here in a moment that our ship was not a cargo ship, it was a troop transport ship, but it started its life out, as all Victory ships did, with the standard cargo ship uh, design, and then there was a secondary process to turn it into a troop ship, which we'll talk about in a moment. So it has a 6,000 horsepower steam turbine engine, which is much, much faster than the Liberty ship, three decks, and a cruising speed of 15 knots. This ship, the SS Hood Victory, started on April 25th, 1945, was incredibly built in 39 days. That's really incredible when you think about anything getting built now of that magnitude that this ship was, was produced. Um, I read a statistic that at this point in the war, one ship a day was being produced in 1945 of this style. Battleships, carriers, cargo ships, cruisers, one ship a day. Really, really incredible. Um, so, the all-important christening of the ship. The buzz on campus was, was, was one of, of high excitement. Uh, once the, the college had learned, um, and this was publicized, uh, in the uh, blue and gray today, uh, that the ship was um, going to be christened. Here's a picture. Now, this isn't actually the SS Hood Victory. This was a victory ship of the time. So, one of the things I found in the photo that was not connected to the actual blue and gray May 4th uh, edition here, and so I kept looking at it and I said, I don't see Hood Victory on the side of this ship. This can't be the Hood Victory. And I was correct that, in fact, the picture that you'll see um, later on is just an, a victory ship of the same style. When you look at one, they all look the same. The only thing that designates them differently is on the front of the ship, uh, the, the name. Uh, but they all look very, very similar. Um, so again, on campus, there was a lot of anticipation for the christening ceremony. The students were extremely, extremely proud that the college was going to have a ship named after. Um, as you saw earlier, there was a lot of effort at the time to support the war effort. So 
this was an extremely high honor and really uh, a, um, uh, the cherry on the top of the Sunday, if you will.